Hi, welcome to Theorem Mechanics Transvariance. This is the second video of the Transvariance paper, and we're going to cover reflection and length transvariances, also formerly called length contraction. The video sequence has changed, so this is the new video sequence. I'm not going to read it to you. This again is video number two. So I, I made these little boilerplates here to remind me what I have to demonstrate. So here is our fancy dancy simulator. And what I'm going to simulate for you is the Michelson-Morley experiment in a stationary mode. Oh wait, before I do that. So in this mode there's a pulse of light that goes out it reflects off the mirror. Now don't mind this, this is a mistake in the algorithm where these these little telltales get stuck. The red means reflected. Okay, and what's coming down here is an equal number of red and yellow, just some are on top of each other, same over here. Okay, now three things to recognize here. Okay, the time was 20 time units. Okay, that's just a little rounding error there. And what I mean by 20 time units is this simulation is set up such that the light propagates at one unit of length per one unit of time to make everything simple. Okay, so if I end up saying it's 20 seconds, whatever, whatever, I really mean 20 units of time. Okay, and the other thing is, is the, the, the items that got here and the items that got here arrived at the same time. And the other thing that's very, very important to recognize, because we're going to cover this next, is the items that reflected up stayed perpendicular to the mirror at all times. So that has to happen even if this system is in motion. Now, to make, to make things less cluttered, I'm going to use a single pulse and show you this again. Okay, so if a single pulse of light comes out, it gets reflected, and that's the one that goes, because that's a partial mirror, gets reflected off that mirror, turns red just so you can tell which one's which. Okay, and here is a red and a yellow, and here's a red and a yellow. Okay, again, you notice how when this guy reflected off the mirror, it stayed perfectly perpendicular to the mirror and came perfectly perpendicular back, and both items arrived at the same time. So this behavior needs to be obeyed, even if this system is in motion, to obey the gift. So let's put this simple system in motion. Now watch, when this pulse of light hits this mirror, instead of staying with the mirror, like my mouse would be staying with the mirror, you see that the pulse of light is moving off to the left. Well, if that really happened, then we would be able to detect our motion through the universe. So that can't possibly be happening. And so the question is, well, what's going on here? This isn't an issue of time dilation. It's not an issue of length contraction. There's something else that physicists have completely missed. Okay, and let me show you what that is. I'm going to put this off to the side, and we're going to continue on. See, typically what we expect is when a pulse of light comes in and hits a mirror, that it's going to reflect perpendicular. Well, you know what I mean. It, 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 it equal and opposite reflection. It's going, to, it's going to come in horizontal and leave vertical. Okay, but the problem is this does not happen when we're in motion. Okay, and so what I'm going to show you now is we have to understand how light actually reflects. Here's another simulation. And what you see over here, these little uh, balls represent the leading edge of a pulse of light. Okay, they're moving off to the right to hit this reflective mirror. And this is not a non moving mirror, it's a stationary mirror, and this is what happens. Okay, now I'm showing you this, and I'm going to stop it there. So you notice that the wave fronts line up, and they stay with the mirror. So this would be the direction of the reflected beam, and these actually end up becoming the direction of the refracted beam, or the beam that passes through the partially uh, silvered mirror, and this ends up coming out perfectly straight and perfectly vertical. So now let me show you what happens when the mirror is in motion. Now 
Now you notice the, the refracted beam is still coming off horizontal like it should. But look at the beam that reflects toward the top. It's not going up vertical. It's going up at an angle up toward this direction. There's a slight upward direction. Let me highlight that direction to you. Okay, that would be this. It's going up at an angle. That's what should occur. And let me show you this using something every day that works the exact same way. If I take a ping pong ball and I have a stationary ping pong paddle that's oriented at 45 degrees and I throw a ping pong ball at it, it's going to reflect like light does at exactly a 90 degree angle or 45 from the vertical. Okay, but at, at the point that this ping pong ball struck, if this mirror were in motion, okay, that ping pong ball is going to take a different path away from the point of impact such that it'll always remain perpendicular to the point of impact or vertical from the point of impact. This actually happens in the real world. So from the perspective of the person moving with the mirror, it looks like the, the reflection was a stationary reflection. It came in, it bounced off, and went vertical. Okay, this is transvariances. These happen using simple, normal Newtonian physics. There's no voodoo here. This is simple physics. In the paper, I do the calculations for the reflection coefficients, and that's in the paper, section 3.4. I'll show you how to get to the paper in a moment. So if we take our simulation here, and we enable the transvariant reflection coefficients to be used and we show that simulation again now we're going to find that this the pulse of light is going to remain per between perpendicular vertical to the center of the mirror as the mirror moves okay now it looks like it's moving with the experiment okay then it reflects back Oh, but look, they're not perfectly lined up. What's going on there? There's something else we're missing here. Absolutely. And that is why you need length contraction. So now we're going to add in the transvariant correction for length contraction. Perfect. The only issue now that we still have with this is that the, the package of reflectance that went this way arrived at the source before this arrived here. Okay, and you'll notice that the simulation time is 21 and a half time units instead of 20 time units. This is the time dilated time, the time of the train. Okay, this thing we're calling this the train. This is the ether. The ether's not in motion, and this is the universal time. Okay, because the ether's not in motion, the universal time and the ether time are going to be the same. This is calculated using the standard time dilation equation. That's one of the other things we have to account for. A, why did this packet arrive first when it should have arrived at the same time? It's what happens when it's stationary. And why doesn't the time here reflect these the time that would have been measured? If it was stationary, this should have come out to be 20 time units instead of 21 and a half time units. Okay, well, we're going to cover that in the next edition of the transvariance series. But the interesting thing here that I'm showing you is that relativity only covers length contraction and time dilation. There are so many other considerations that need to be accounted for to properly compensate the Michelson Morley experiment for the gift. Okay. Oh, I got to get this out of the way. So if you want to go find the paper, go to my website, distinti.com. Go down to the Ethereal Mechanics tab. In there, you'll see paper one. There's a PDF. You'll click on it. And the PDF has links to YouTube videos, which you can watch these simulations. Or if you want to become a Patreon member, of pass first class passengers and above will have access to the application. Uh, that'll happen soon, as soon after the transvariance sequence of papers is, is put in a new video form because I've been updating it, so I want to put out the latest version when I'm done. 
Okay, if you are signed up to be an engineer or above, you're going to have access to the source code. And so you can do your own simulations, run a lot of other things. And again, the last video of the series is going to be how do you use the tool to make your own simulations. Okay, so if you want to sign up for the Patreon site, go here. The blog site's here. Uh, and if you want to see why we need to do this, uh, click on this, which you can also get there from here. Okay, again, these are the links to everything. If you can help, I'd appreciate it. And no more voodoo physics. Thank you very much.